Welcome everybody to today's seminar on lipids, lipidomics, and its application in pharmaceutical and biomarker research. I'm Christian, CTO at Lipotype and responsible for R&D. Lipotype is a lipidomics service provider based in Dresden, Germany. We are providing lipidomics analysis services based on our shotgun mass spectrometry technology, and we are the first and worldwide only GMP certified lipidomics laboratory. We are a spin-off of the Max Planck Institute of Molecular Cell Biology and Genetics, and Lipotype was founded by its CEO, Professor Kai Simons, who is one of the leading researchers in the field of lipid and membrane biology. As our shotgun epidomics technology is applicable to a wide range of sample types, we find our customers in very different fields. First of all, in biotech and pharma, we support, for example, in clinical research and drug discovery. For the food industry, we are, for example, involved in intervention studies for the development of functional foods. And with our skin lipidomics technology, we work for the cosmetics industry in the areas of claim support and topical drug development. And finally, we support academic researchers by analyzing lipids in various model organisms. What is our philosophy and our motivation? Why do we do lipidomics? With our vision, Lipidomics for a Better Life, we want to increase the information about the state of an individual's health. Today, when you go to the doctor, only two lipid parameters are analyzed, triglycerides and cholesterol. These parameters are used for the assessment of risk of cardiovascular diseases. But there are more than hundreds of additional parameters. The triglycerides have different fatty acid compositions. They differ, for example, in saturation and chain length. The same is true for the esterified cholesterols. In addition to triglycerides and cholesterol, many other lipids exist which are not measured in the clinic, for example, phospholipids and sphingolipids. Our goal is to make use of this information, make it available for the assessment of health and disease at the molecular level by means of lipidomics. And I will show you later how far we got with this. What is lipidomics? Lipidomics is the large-scale study of pathways and networks of cellular lipids and biological systems. Analogous to genomics, transcriptomics, and proteomics, which deal with the study of genes, transcripts, and proteins respectively, the lipid complement of an organism is studied by lipidomics. Lipidomics is part of metabolomics, shown here, which deals with metabolites. But lipidomics is special because lipids are not water soluble and have specific structural features which pose their analysis challenging. Despite their uniqueness, they are an integral part of cells, tissues, and organisms by playing central roles in energy metabolism, as signaling molecules, and as building blocks of cellular structures. Lipidomics clearly is an emerging technology. In 2012, when Lipotype was founded, there were about 200 papers listed in PubMed with the keyword lipidomics. Last year, in 2020, there were more than 1,500 lipidomics papers published, a 15-fold increase in 10 years. This shows that lipids are gaining more and more attention in a wide range of different research areas, which reflects their ubiquitous presence. For examples, for example, lipids are a central building block of our skin. Namely, they form the stratum corneum, the outermost layer of our bodies, maintaining a tight barrier against pathogens, contaminations, and the evaporation of water. Furthermore, lipids are nutrients in our diet. Once eaten, they enter our bloodstream in structures called lipoprotein particles. These lipoproteins consist of an outer shell of phospholipids and a core of neutral storage lipids, the triglycerides and cholesterol esters. The lipoproteins are the vehicles used by our bodies to transport lipids to the various organs, where they serve as nutrients and building blocks for cellular structures in the form of membranes. Cellular membranes are, are a bilayer of lipids that surround our cells and form intracellular structures, the organelles. Not only do they form these surroundings, but they are also the medium in which transmembrane proteins are embedded, as shown here. About 30% of the proteome are transmembrane proteins, many of which play important roles in cell-cell signaling, interactions and signaling processes that are fundamental to disease mechanisms in, for example, diabetes and cancer. However, it is not at all it is not that all membranes are alike. They differ significantly in their lipid composition, resulting in different biophysical properties. For example, the plasma membrane, as shown here, surrounding the cell, 
shows high concentrations of cholesterol, saturated phospholipids, and sphingolipids compared with other organelles such as the endoplasmatic reticulum, shown here, or the Golgi apparatus, shown here. The membrane composition is fine-tuned to its function. In case of the plasma membrane, this is to form the outermost border of a cell and to be able to form dynamic nanoscopic membrane domains called lipid drafts, which play important roles in cellular signaling, in cellular signaling events. The variations in membrane compositions enhance differences in membrane properties of the different cellular subcompartments are achieved by stunning structural diversity of lipid molecules. In theory, there can be tens of thousands of different lipid molecules. How so? You see, lipids are made of building blocks. Many of them consist of a charged head group, shown here in green, and a hydrophobic part, usually made up of hydrocarbon chains, shown here. Examples are phospholipids, up here, and glycerophospholipids, down here. To a large degree, the structural diversity is achieved by variations in the hydrophobic part of the molecules, the fatty acids, here. They can have different lengths or different numbers of positions or positions of double bonds, and they can be bound to the lipid backbone in different ways. For example, by ester or ether bonds, as shown here. And these variations give rise to different lipid species or subspecies. Variations in the lipid head groups here in green and here give rise to different lipid classes. So now, while combinatorically the possibilities are almost endless, the actual lipid composition of an organism is limited by its complement of lipid synthesizing enzymes and their substrate specificities. Therefore, with modern analytical techniques, a few thousand lipid molecules can be detected in mammals, with the actual composition depending on the type of body fluid, tissue or organ that is analyzed. Historically, the lipid composition of biological samples was analyzed by thin layer chromatography, shown here. This method allows for the analysis of the lipid composition on the lipid class level, for example, phosphatidylcholine or phosphatidylethanolamine, shown here. That means that while lipid molecules with various charged head groups can be nicely separated in forms of bands here, information on the presence or quantities of individual lipid molecules can typically not be easily obtained. This changed when analytical scientists started to exploit the power of mass spectrometry in order to analyze lipids at the molecular level, as you can see here. These are mass spectra showing peaks for each individual lipid molecule. This development led to the rise of lipidomics. Now, with the availability of high-resolution mass analyzers in benchtop format, mass spectrometry has become the gold standard for the qualitative and quantitative lipid analysis at the molecular level. How does lipid analysis in the mass spec work? The mass spectrum, as shown here in the top panel, has an x-axis showing the masses of the detected molecules and a y-axis showing the signal intensity. The signal intensity corresponds to the abundance of a molecule. The more there is of a given molecule, the higher the intensity. The lipid molecules can now be annotated based on their molecular mass, which obviously is based on the elemental composition. In order to obtain quantitative results, typically internal standards are used for normalization, like here in green. These are spiked at known amounts to the sample before lipid extraction and mass spec analysis and allow, and allow for the calculation of molecular concentrations, or mol of molar concentrations, actually. So during the mass spec analysis, the intact lipid molecules can be subjected to fragmentation, as shown here in the lower panel. This gives rise to building block-specific fragment spectra, as shown down here. In this example, fragmentation allows us to determine the exact fatty acid composition of the lipid molecule. So we see a fragment for the oleic acid fragment and a peak for the palmitic acid fragment. Therefore, mass spectrometry allows for both a quantitative and a structural analysis in a single, in a single run for each sample. This is a typical shotgun lipidomics workflow. Lipids and biological samples are extracted with organic solvents using a fully automated pipetting robot in 96 well format. The lipid extracts are then directly infused into the mass spec by a robot by a robotic nano uh, electrospray ionization source, also in 96 well format, shown here. Then the mass spectra are acquired on Q executives with high resolution orbit rack technology, shown here. 
after the mass spectra are required, the lipid identification is performed with a dedicated software called Lipotype Explorer. During that step, the masses in the mass spectra are turned into actual lipids. And finally, statistical analysis is done. This may include simple t-tests, multivariate analysis, pathway and enrichment analysis, but also sophisticated machine learning approaches. The Lipotype Shotgun Lipidomics technology provides a broad range of broad coverage of lipids. In total, we can detect more than 3,000 individual lipid molecules in more than 50 different lipid classes. The technology is applicable to a large variety of sample types, such as body fluids like blood plasma, blood serum, but also cellular material, microorganisms, and skin and tissue and organ samples. Another advantage of this technology is that we require only minimal sample amounts per analysis. For example, one microliter of blood plasma is sufficient or about 100,000 cells of a cell culture sample. I would now like to turn to some applications of the shotgun lipidomics technology. The first will deal with lipid biomarker identification in large cohort studies, and the other one will be about the use of lipidomics in the understanding of molecular mechanisms of cancer. In a recent publication, we have identified a lipidomic blood signature for obesity together with our co-workers from the universities of Helsinki in Finland and Lund in Sweden. We asked ourselves the question, is health reflected in the lipidome? And if so, what is the information content compared with classical clinical parameters? We wanted to assess that for the example of obesity, because it is a risk factor for several diseases, like coronary heart disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes, metabolic syndrome, and cancer. There are different ways to measure obesity. Body mass index, BMI, waist to hip ratio, and body fat percentage. And in order to address the question whether obesity is reflected in the human plasma, we analyzed more than 5,000 plasma samples using our shotgun lipidomics technology from two different cohorts, the Malmö Diet and Cancer Study and the FinRisk Study. These are population-wide cohorts with extensive longitudinal medical records. Based on the lipidomics data from FinRisk, we built a mathematical model with obesity as outcome. The model was then validated in the completely independent Malmö cohort. As I said, we used obesity as outcome, and obesity was based, was measured as body fat percentage, waist to hip ratio, and BMI. We first wanted to know which parameter is best reflected in the lipidome. And you can see here the result of the cross validation for the different obesity readouts in terms of a cross validation error here on the y axis of the graph. The lower the error, the better the parameter is reflected in the lipidome. And it turns out that body fat percentage works best, while BMI is not so well reflected in the blood lipidome, having a higher cross-validation error than the other two parameters. As I mentioned earlier, the obesity model was built on the Finnish cohort and validated in the Swedish cohort. The result for that validation is shown here. One can see that the validation error here in green is not so much different from the cross-validation error and also from the training and the testing error, indicating that overfitting does not seem to be an issue and the model is robustly working in a completely independent sample and data set. When looking at the lipids that are used by the model in order to reflect the obesity state of a subject, it turns out that they are distributed across the entire lipidome. The tick marks in this figure indicate the lipids used by the mathematical model there are, for example, triglycerides, shown here, and cholesterol esters, shown here. And this is not surprising. It mainly confirms that obese people have high levels of triglycerides and cholesterol in their blood. However, the fact that also many phospholipids and sphingolipids, as shown here, phosphatidylcholine, sphingomyelin, and many other phospholipids, are part of the obesity signature indicates that the aberrations of lipid metabolism and obesity go way beyond triglycerides and cholesterol. And this is confirmed by the following analysis. But before proceeding with that, one needs to know that there are different layers of information in the lipidome based on different structural levels. Levels. So we have lipid categories such as glycerophospholipids, glycerolipids, and so on. But also lipid classes like the phosphatidylcholines, triglycerides, cholesterol esters and then lipid species and subspecies, with more and more structural information available on the different levels on the hierarchy. So now, 
We have used these different levels of lipid information in order to determine obesity in different subjects. When using only clinical information, such as classical cholesterol data, shown here with a black line, you get a quite high error for the obesity prediction. So in this graph, the error for the prediction is shown here on the y-axis. When we now add more and more lipid information, like the blue line here, lipid categories, green line lipid classes, and then orange and red lipid species and subspecies, our, our assessment of obesity becomes better and better. This shows that the lipidome is much more informative than classical clinical parameters, and that molecular details matter for the understanding of obesity. So that result sort of closes the circle to our motivation presented earlier, to make use of molecular lipid information in the assessment of health and disease. I would now like to turn to the last topic of my presentation, and that is the role of lipidomics in understanding disease mechanisms in cancer. Many of you are probably familiar with the hallmarks of cancer proposed by Hanahan and Weinberg. In 2011, they added deregulating cellular energetics as an emerging hallmark, shown here. Cellular energetics, that includes lipid metabolism. And consequently, today there are several drug candidates in the pipeline that target lipid metabolism. For example, drugs targeting the fatty acid transporter CD36, fatty acid synthetase, but also the fatty acid desaturase SCD, to name only a few. But how are lipids mechanistically linked to cancer? This is the schematic pre presentation of the vulnerability of cancer cells towards inhibition of fatty acid desaturation under the metabol metabol metabolically compromised conditions of the tumor microenvironment, meaning tumor cells that are very distant from the blood vasculature, actually. Scientists believe that tumor cells are exposed to conditions of reduced availability of exogenous lipids because of the distance from the blood vasculature, making them vulnerable towards inhibition of fatty acid desaturation. The inhibition of the fatty acid desaturase, here shown on the left or on the right hand side of the panel, causes relative accumulation of saturated fatty acids and disturbs cardiolipin compositions. Cardiolipin is an important lipid in mitochondria, and this results in release of cytochrome C, reduced mitochondrial activity, enhanced sensitivity towards chemotherapeutic drugs, and reduced tumor growth. In another more recent example, the authors could show that genomic aberrations in cancer cells result in increased activity of an acyl transferase. This in turn leads to an increase in saturated phosphatidylcholine lipids in the cellular membranes. Now this, in turn, again leads to an increased activity of oncogenic receptors such as the epidermal growth factor receptor, which results in enhanced tumor progression and poor survival rates. In another study that applied lipotype shotgun lipidomics technology, the authors found out how lipid synthesizing enzymes drive prostaglandin synthesis, which is required for cancer proliferation. The starting point for icosanoid and prostaglandin synthesis is arachidonic acid, highlighted here. This is a fatty acid produced by phospholipase A, which cleaves the arachidonic acid of the membrane phospholipid precursors. And arachidonic acid then serves as the, as the starting point for the synthesis of various icosanoids or prostaglandins, as shown here in this scheme. So it's known that prostaglandins promote tumor growth by di directly activating signaling pathways which control cancer cell proliferation, anchorage independent growth, cellular migration, and apoptosis. As mentioned earlier, arachidonic acid is produced from membrane phospholipids, and these in turn are produced by the activation of free fatty acids through acyl-CoA synthetases, shown here, so here's free fatty acid, transformed to a fatty acid CoA, so the active form of fatty acid. And these fatty acid CoAs are subsequently attached to form diacyl phospholipids by acyl transferases. So these acyl transferases take the activated fatty acids and add them to a lysophospholipid shown here, which results in a diacyl phospholipid with two fatty acids shown here. So, 
And these phospholipids present in the membranes are the precursors for arachidonic acid, which in turn is used for the synthesis of eicosanoids and prostaglandins. So now when the authors knock out the acyl-CoA synthase, this one here, they observe a reduction in arachidonic acid containing phospholipids. And this result is shown here. So you see here, mainly in phosphatidylinositol and phosphatidylethanolamine, a reduction in those lipid species that actually contain um, arachidonic acid shown here. So here you see uh, the reduction in all these arachidonic acid containing lipid species. They went on then to knock out also the acyltransferase in cells and observe a decrease in prostaglandin levels. So actually, by interfering with the synthesis of the phospholipids, they end up with a reduction in prostaglandins. The same they actually saw with the knockdown of the acyl-CoA synthetase. That means that inhibiting the synthesis of the arachidonic acid precursors leads to the reduction of prostaglandins. In vivo, this knockout actually reduces the tumor burden of mice carrying xenografts. That's shown here in panel A. You see here the knockout condition, tumor burden, uh, shown on the y-axis, is much lower than in the control conditions. Furthermore, this knockout also improves the survival of these mice, as shown here in panel B. So you see here the blue line and the knockout. The mice live much longer than in the control condition. In conclusion, in this study, lipidomics was integral to elucidate that the acyl-CoA synthetase, ACSL3, and the acyl transferase ALPI81 regulate cancer cell proliferation by affecting prostaglandin synthesis. The authors speculate about targeting this axis to selectively target tumor-derived prostaglandin synthesis as a potential treatment strategy. And the use of this axis as biomarker for personalized anti-cancer treatment in human lung tumors. In summary, I have given you an introduction to lipids and lipidomics and how lipidomics was used to identify lipid biomarkers for obesity and to unravel disease mechanisms and cancer. If you are interested in further details and would like to discuss specific applications, please contact us at info at Thank you for your attention and goodbye.